I was surfing around on the 10th Planet forums one day and I was looking at some instructor videos. I noticed a unique set of videos, one technique called Opera, there was another Mono Plata, and a Sock Lock, basically an Estima Lock. And the guy that was teaching the techniques, I was very impressed with the, the way he made his deliveries, the way he explained the details, and I began to follow him. And I followed his Facebook, his Instagram, and currently he has a, a segment called One Minute Jiu-Jitsu Hack. And it's incredible how much information that you can learn from this guy in one minute. His name is Brandon McCatherin. He's a 10th Planet Black Belt down in Decatur, Alabama. You'll want to go down there and check him out if you're around in the area. Also check out his website. And it's flooded with techniques with a minimal price per month. But we're going to get into that. A little bit more on episode five of Mega Talks. All right, I'm Christopher Thompson here with Mega Talks Podcast, and I have on the line with me is Brandon McCatherin. He's a 10th Planet Black Belt out of Decatur, Alabama. How you doing today, Brandon? Man, I'm doing great. Cool. Great. And I understand you just got out of class, so I'm not going to take up just a whole lot of your time because I know you're busy taking over the world, starting from Alabama and going outwards. Yeah, well, I'm trying to. You know, I don't know if it's working or not. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Definitely getting out there. And I'll go ahead and, you know, how I got introduced to you was... Um, off the 10th planet website really i was watching some techniques down there and um a few of your videos were in the technique section and that's how i got kind of turned on to you and started following you and um your adventures in the jiu-jitsu land the world of jiu-jitsu and 10th planet and um ask you about um recently we go back to a couple of weeks ago you had a scheduled fight uh for june 10th i think it was fight to win pro 36 against yep. uh, Sergio Steven Ardilla? Yes, Sergio. He's a bad dude. Oh, yeah. And I, I was tracking the fight, and I was excited about the fight and uh, saw that you uh, sustained the injury. So do you want to tell us what uh, a little bit about what happened, set that up about the injury? Yeah, you know, I'm probably okay. I have a AC joint injury in my right shoulder, and uh, it's been pretty bad a couple of times. Like, I've missed several months at a time with it. But uh, it's not it's not nearly as bad as it was the last time, so that's good news. So I'm really just yeah. probably missing a few weeks of hard training, and then I should be, in theory, I should be good to go. I just got like a lot of mus muscular soreness, and mm -hmm. then a, you know AC sprain. You don't want to mess with it too much. You got to give it a little time, but it's not nearly as bad as like a full separation that I had the last time. Oh, well, that's good. Did y'all, um, yeah. were you able to reschedule the fight or how was that? I haven't going? tried yet. I haven't tried yet. I'm not even back to rolling yet, really. I mean, I've been on the mat a little bit, uh -huh. but I can't, I can't really train right now. Not for real. Not the way you have to. Oh, so okay. I'm just waiting to see how it goes, but it shouldn't be more than a couple of weeks. I'll be okay. okay. I'm not crippled or anything for sure. So uh -huh. I'll be definitely recoverable. Now, what was preparation for this fight? Was this like um, a little, was it a fight camp or how much notice did you have about the? No, no, I only had 10 days. So um, they they just got with me about 10 days before the event. And um, so I didn't have a lot of time to get ready for it. So that's a pretty but quick turnaround. Quick, yeah, it's pretty quick, but that's fine. I want my jujitsu to be, you know, ready to go right now. Mm -hmm. against whoever. So. And I see he was a pretty dangerous dude. I would watch a few of his matches. Yeah, and, he's really good, man. Mm -hmm. Really good. Of course, he has his uh, hands full, if you know, that the match would have happened because I've seen what you can do um, in your matches. Yeah, well, I'm good, too. <laughs> and um, we'll talk about a little bit about your competition, um, competition experience going back. Uh, how much um, competition experience uh, do you have? Well, I've competed – quite a bit at every belt level, but I'm not like some dude who's setting the world on fire with my competition record. It's never really been my focus, but I also know that it's important um, to me in order to like grow in the best way that I can. And it's important to my coach, Eddie, that, uh, that his generals and his leaders compete. And so I always took that on 
but it's never like I don't love competing. Mm-hmm. I I see a lot of value in it, but I kind of have to make myself do it. I don't know that I that I would call myself a uh, amazing competitor. I got a better. I got a lot more wins than losses, but I also have plenty of losses. You know, so I'm just a regular old dude. I'm not some super athlete. I just like jujitsu a lot and stayed with it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. Um, and you come from, were you, were you born in Decatur? I was actually born, uh, well, yeah, I was born in Decatur, but I was I was raised um, right next door in this little town called Speak, Alabama. Oh, so okay. it's really rural. You know, like my public high school had like 500 people, K through 12. So very mm-hmm. small, very small town. Mm-hmm. Everybody not, knows everybody. Yeah, yeah, not even really a town, to be honest with you. Yeah. It's kind of similar to where I come from, you know, I'm um, smaller town, but, um, now did you grow up doing martial arts there or how did you get turned on to martial arts, you know, coming up as a kid? So both of my parents were into Taekwondo, especially my mom when I was younger. And I was always into like, you know, Ninja Turtles and huh. uh, then I, then it was like, uh, Chuck Norris a lot. I was a big Chuck Norris fan growing up. Uh, I didn't really get into Bruce Lee actually until I was a little older, but like mm-hmm. Chuck Norris, Van Damme, all these kind of movies, Jackie Chan. I like oh, those okay. kind of movies growing up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I watched a lot of that, but I never really trained. Um, when I was, I don't know, man, 12 or 13, I can't remember exactly which year it was, but we were having a spin the knot party with my buddy. Like just, a, you know, all of us over at his house, like five or six of us. And his dad had recorded the Ultimate Fighting Championship oh, number yeah. six. It was on VHS. He had recorded it off of the pay-per-view, I guess. Uh-huh. And uh, we watched it after after everybody went to bed. We all sat down and watched it. It was awesome. And so I've been pretty much watching the UFC since then. But I didn't really, get, wow. I didn't ever consider training. Really, I never really considered it uh-huh. until. Man, I was 25, I think, when I started. So was, you started as, um, in jiu-jitsu or you started uh, more training in taekwondo? Um, no, I didn't. I never did train taekwondo. My parents did. So I've been around martial arts a lot. Oh, okay. But I ended up, when we signed up, when we started, I had gotten kind of overweight and out of shape and just gross. And my wife and I actually started together because we were nice. both looking for a way that I could kind of lose some weight. And mm-hmm. get my health back in order because I was, you know, not living like a super healthy lifestyle. I wasn't. It was just like food and like bad diet and no exercise, the kind of bad uh-huh. lifestyle, you know. A little bit out of balance. Yeah, just like typical Southern diet, typical Southern oh, <laughs> work. Fried food. Yeah, fried <laughs> foods and and then you put that together with no exercise and that's a bad combination, man. Yeah. And so that's. That's how I actually got started. So we just went and signed up at this place called Webster's Karate, which is here in Decatur. Actually uh-huh. turned out to be a great school, but they had they did a little bit of grappling, you know. So it wasn't a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school, but they did grappling and they had an MMA program. Huh. Okay. Uh, and we didn't have a Brazilian jiu-jitsu here. So it was kind of more um, like a self-defense type of grappling thing rather than yeah, like a sport. Yeah, it was a tongue sudo program. So I ended up getting my black belt in Tung Sudo there. And, uh, but that was also my opportunity to train MMA and start learning grappling as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then at white belt, just a couple months later, I went to my first Eddie Bravo seminar. And then I just, uh, decided I wanted to work on both ranks at the same time. So I started working through the ranks with Eddie as well. So what was his seminar? Was it at Alabama? Yeah, it was in Birmingham, Alabama, which is about an hour and a half away from here. Okay. But it was at this school. I think it was called Shadow MMA or something like I think that was it. Uh-huh. But it doesn't exist anymore. It's not there anymore, the one I'm thinking about. Okay. But, yeah, that's how I met Eddie the first time. And then I just pretty much just chased him all over the country. Like, my rule <laughs> used to be if he was within 10 hours of drive time, I was wow. going to be there. And so that's – and then, of course, I would fly out to L.A. a bunch and then – try to fly him and a bunch of his, you know, high ranking instructors out here to learn from. So man, that's serious uh, dedication for jujitsu. 
Well, like, you know how it is, man. Like jujitsu has this way of like hooking you, putting it, <laughs> putting the hooks in, so to speak. Uh huh. And, and take it over. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's a weird thing. So yeah, I never thought. I mean, I was always into martial arts, uh-huh. but as a spectator, you know, I didn't think that I was ever going to be a martial artist. But now, how did I you guess make that's the, what I am? Uh-huh. <laughs> how did you make the jump from just um, you know being the student? of his and you know chasing him around to these different areas and how did you become to the transition from student to affiliate for 10th planet well that was i got my affiliation i became a 10th planet affiliate when i was still a blue belt and so eddie was like look that's you know, a tough if you one wanna, <laughs> yeah you want to represent the team like you know we're happy to have you you're a hard worker and everything but just know the chances of you surviving as a blue belt affiliate are very slim. Mm-hmm. He said most people flunk out. They just their jujitsu is not good enough. They don't know enough about, you know, the game to make it happen. And most people by blue belt don't even know if they're quitters or not yet. Yeah. And I was like, I just took it as a, as a challenge. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah, I just decided I was gonna not just be an affiliate, but I was gonna be. A, you know, one of the leaders of the organization. So that's what I'm trying to lead from the front for the whole team, not just our team here in Decatur, but for oh, the whole yeah. global organization. Now, now, what year was that? When I was a blue belt? Yes. For, uh, I think it was 2009 that we became. Oh, NFL. okay. All right. I remember hearing, um, you know, following Eddie and watching some of his videos, I remember hearing him talk about, you know, people who start um jujitsu schools basically not just 10th planet but anybody you know as white belts or blue belts and how tough it can be and what kind of students that you would get and how you know the leading the team is really important and it's a lot on your shoulders yeah well i i think i do a, a pretty good job as a leader like i try because i care you know what i'm saying so like i take i treat it as a, a big responsibility not just not just something some role that i've been thrust into i wasn't thrust into this role Uh i took this role on myself you know and i want i want the the responsibility of leading so that's what i'm trying to do trying to do a good job mess up a lot but (laughs) that comes with uh any kind of type of business or or goal that you have it's gonna be a lot of failures and you know but a lot more successes I don't know. I think a lot more failures in my experience. <laughs> but that's good, though. Like, uh-huh. I look at that as uh, as just the cost of getting good at a thing. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. Like, you're going to be terrible at it in the beginning. What What would you um, – how would you explain your philosophy in, um, uh, say, jiu-jitsu? Uh, I believe jiu-jitsu is supposed to be – uh, a way of seeing the world, not just a way to incapacitate an attacker. Mm. So I would say that my jujitsu, if I'm doing it properly, if I'm learning and training properly, I should be improving every area of my life, not just my grappling skill. So as nice. I learn, as I learn the depths of jujitsu, I learn it's not about arm bars and triangles and rear naked chokes, you mm-hmm. know. Jiu-jitsu is made of patience. Jiu-jitsu is made of perseverance. Jiu-jitsu is made of a steadfast character of never quitting. Like the things that translate and really make uh, make a difference in the areas of your life that are really important uh-huh. are the same things that make a difference in your jiu-jitsu. Nice. So, I like that. A, if nobody listens to any part of the podcast, they need to listen to that part right there. Especially if you um, have done jujitsu or plan on doing jujitsu, because yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think anything that's worth doing, and worth seeking with all your heart, should can should teach you those things about every other thing in your life. So there's a great book called The Art of Learning by this guy named Josh Waitzkin. I don't know if you're familiar with this book. I think I've heard but that name. It's it, you know it's got it's like one of my desert island books. You know what I mean. Uh-huh. <laughs> so anyway, in that book, he says how you learn anything is how you learn everything. And so if you can learn 
to recognize. So like you, you learn a lesson about patience in jujitsu that shouldn't just be a jujitsu lesson. Huh, that nice. should be a, that should be a marriage counseling session as well. Mm -hmm. If you learn about perseverance in jujitsu, that shouldn't just be perseverance in jujitsu. That should be learning to stick with it when your job is hard because you know it's worth it in the long run. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's for sure. That's the kind of stuff that that really makes jujitsu worth the effort and worth the I – mean, it's expensive, but it's worth – it's worth it because of what it brings into the other parts of your life. Yeah. Even if you never get, even if you never get a black belt, even if you never become a competitor or a world champion, that doesn't matter. Like, mm -hmm. Who cares? And you find those those guys, you know, competitors and people in the spotlight more, and then sometimes that frustrates, you know, just uh, just the average Joe that walks in the school and they see all the competitors, and sometimes they think, well, the you know the instructors. They baby or they cater to the competitors, but you know they don't spend enough time with me. Yeah, I hear I've heard people voice that concern before. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not one that usually gets voiced here because it's not it's just not the way that our team has been built. We're built for normal people, you know, <laughs> like yeah, like just regular people that want to improve themselves, like that are looking to build their character or build their physical strength or build their mental health. Like that's the kind of people that we're looking to involve here. So we have good competitors, Oh yeah, but it's that's a for byproduct sure. of just having good jujitsu. We don't train, we don't, you know, normally train competitors. Like we're training and learning the art of jujitsu. That's kind of the way I've, I've structured the culture here. Oh yeah. You got to have the standard and then the, competitiveness is, um, is kind of a byproduct of what you learn. Yeah, well, I just feel like, man, you know, obviously I think competition is its own beast. And you uh -huh. have to master the skill of competing. That's true. And definitely athleticism plays a role in competing. That's true as well. Uh -huh. But I also believe that jujitsu in its purest form can transcend all of that. And agree, like if your jujitsu – is pure and clean and beautiful, then you can compete with the best in the world, regardless of who you are. And if you're jujitsu, and maybe not win, but yeah. you can belong on the mat with those people. Mm -hmm. you know? Just so, have that survival mentality. Just well, just by having, just by training your jujitsu, like training the essence of jujitsu, the effortlessness, the efficiency. You know, because like no matter how strong I make myself or how hard I work, I'm not going to be bigger and stronger than Andre Galvao. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> but I do believe that I can train my jujitsu to be clean enough that I can get out there on the mat and roll with Galvao or whoever. I'm, I'm just singling him out because he's like a big, strong guy, right? <laughs> or whoever. Uh, I believe I can get out there and train with them and them say he deserves a black belt. Mm -hmm. That's all I care about. Like, I don't, I don't care if I can beat Andre Galval. I don't think I'll ever be able to beat Andre Galval. <laughs> but that doesn't. I don't lose any sleep over that because that's not what my jujitsu is about. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I definitely understand that. Um, I think some people I'm look at it the other way, though. I'm not saying that's that, more that more about competition and being on top and being being able to submit anybody rather than just you know a lifestyle of jujitsu and like you said translate that into other areas of your life. Yeah. Well, you know, and it, the thing is it's a hard balance because you don't want to water down the art either. Uh -huh. You know, I think it is for everybody, but at the same time, this ain't for everybody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like anybody can do this, but not, but most people won't. The mental so game is I'm, big. Yeah. So I don't know. It's a tough balance to walk because I believe both of those things at the same time. And they're like polar opposites. Uh -huh. <laughs> So I don't know. Now coming up in the tenth planet uh, ranking system, how much um, how much do you think that um, that mentality attributes to uh, say your progression in your ranking series? Well, I think your mental state is uh, of the utmost importance. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think you got to have you know a really strong mind, a really strong work ethic. Um, you gotta want to, you gotta, you gotta care 
so and again we're like back to that duality of thinking like i have to care what my peers and my and the higher ranks i have to care what they think but i have to equally not care what anybody says about my jujitsu and just keep going yeah you know so you know having to balance the yin and the yang like that i guess Mm -hmm. because there's some people out there that'll be critical no matter what you do and you can't you can't live and try and satisfy that yeah, you can't even like acknowledge people like that. They're not going to be happy no matter what. Yeah, those people are on the sideline. Uh-huh. But at the same time, the people, the real people in the game, you have to care what they think because they're worthy of of their opinion. Like they're worthy of the respect that they're due. And so you have to care what they think. Like the black belts that have done it the right way, and uh-huh. you know, the the hardcore competitors and the people who live for jujitsu. The legends, you have to care what they think. Oh, yeah. You can't care what they think at the same time. It's got to do you. you know, and, so. and, I, so, and, I, and I've seen the, you know, the talks and people, you know, the, tra- the transcendence is, you know, a lot of people are st- stick to the gi. You know, um, who's it? Uh, Hanato. Um, <laughs> you got to be in the gi all the time. You know, jiu jitsu is not jiu jitsu unless you have a gi. And everybody's, <laughs> you know, um, from what I feel, you know, except that you did the 10th planet systems and not a lot of, um, you know, techniques or training inside the gi. I've seen 10th planet people in the gi, but it's not based around, it's not a gi system. It's strictly right. no gi system. So I think you kind of steered around that and, you know, it's accepted from a lot of people. But uh, what was your attraction uh, to 10th planet system for gi versus no gi? Um, it really didn't have that much to do with gi, no gi to me. I, I, that that played a factor for mm-hmm. sure. But the big thing to me was I just appreciated the way that Eddie approached um, like his, his thinking about the martial arts, like his philosophies and stuff about martial arts. Mm-hmm. You know, Eddie's a martial artist. He's a great jujitsu player, but he's a martial artist, you know. He's trained other arts. His son right now is taking classes. He's taking like karate classes, not jujitsu classes. Oh, yeah. You know, nice. I mean, Eddie's in the martial arts. He's a martial artist. Mm-hmm. And he was, mo- he's, especially at that time, he was super focused on the jujitsu in MMA. And that's what I was into. That's why we picked martial okay. arts classes because we were into MMA. We thought that would be a good way to get in shape. So that made a lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and as far as like, Gi, no gi. I just, at that time, especially now, I feel like I have a more open mind. I can see a lot more value in it. But at that time, especially in the beginning, I couldn't wrap my head around the idea that training in one uniform and competing in a completely separate one, uh-huh. how that how that made you better. I couldn't wrap my head around that. And I can I can open my mind to that a little bit differently now. Uh-huh. I still think it's a bit problematic, but I also see a tremendous amount of value in gi training if it's done with the right focus as well. So, you know. Oh yeah. But it never really had that much to do with gi and no gi. Oh, well, and uh, one of the big factors was I heard that jujitsu players busted their fingers a lot playing in the gi. Yeah, I know. And uh, and so. I play guitar and I played guitar a lot at that time. And I, I don't want to hurt my fingers. I won't be able to play guitar. So I just do no gi. I used to think <laughs> the same thing because I, I play guitar also. And when I was introduced to martial arts and, you know, I started in Taekwondo and um, made the little transition to the ground game a little bit, a few years later. Uh, but I was always concerned about, you know, the breaking of the fingers and the breaking of the hands. And it turned out, you know, I had a kickboxing match and I did break my hand. And I'm like, it was my, you know, it was my Fred hand. So it always made me worry. You know, I always worried about it before, but after breaking it, you know, it's like, do I need to keep doing this? Am I going to be able to play guitar? But I, you know, I'm still able to play and, um, you know, it's have fun doing both. I still keep it balanced and I, I try not to break any fingers. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, well, I've never really injured my fingers yet, so. And um, you brought up that um, as being a musician, because a lot of people that I train with are musicians, and some people are, you know, they really don't showcase that a lot. And when I was watching you online, I was watching, I think one of your 
the videos or podcasts where you picked up the guitar and you were playing and singing a little bit. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And I was going to ask you as about, you know, your influences also as a musician and playing the guitar. Um, kind of where does that come from? Or maybe you have um, a few favorite musicians or some influences there that you want to talk about. Yeah, I love music, man. Um, I've been playing. I've been playing music a lot longer than I've been doing martial arts. <laughs> uh did you, did you have any, any bands? When I was coming up, did I play in bands? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I played, like, that was how I made my living for about a year and a half, two years. Oh, really? I played guitar, yeah. I just drove around in my car and uh, played at, like, little coffee shops and mm -hmm. colleges and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I didn't get rich doing that, but I paid all the bills for myself and my wife and kids. So that was cool. But yeah, I, I've been, I mean, I'm not really playing with anybody now, uh -huh. uh, but um, yeah, I was in bands from the time I was 15 till, I don't know, like just a few years ago. So it was like a, a cover band or did you pick up original songs? No, no, we, uh, I've done both, but the last band I was in, we did three albums of original songs. They're all on iTunes. Cool. Yeah. But, um, what's the band name, if you don't mind saying? It was Bucci Shepherd. Bucci Shepherd. Yep. <laughs> Where does that name come from? I gotta ask. That's the name of this uh, this dude I went to school with. That was his name. Oh really? Bucci Shepherd. But he wasn't in the band. We just thought it was a cool sounding name. So. It is definitely a we, cool sounding name. <laughs> our very first. So just a bunch of us grew up playing music together, and there was a battle of the bands at a local like community college, and they were giving away a bunch of money mm -hmm. and uh, CDs and stuff like that. And so we uh, we just got like four guys together, like two days before, and we practiced like three songs. Yeah. And, uh, we didn't have a name, and so we just opened up the yearbook and pulled that one out. And then <laughs> we went we went and won the battle of the bands. That's cool. Oh, what was it? A rock or what kind of genre? Yeah, just like pop rock, cult rock kind of stuff. Oh, okay. Because um, did that have any in an, um? Nothing groundbreaking, I assure you. Oh, really? <laughs> Nothing like Nirvana or anything like that? No, no, no. We weren't uh, setting the world on fire. I, you know, I enjoyed it. I thought we did pretty good, but uh -huh. wasn't was anything uh, revolutionary by any means. <laughs> did that um, kind of fuel the attraction towards Eddie? Because I know he done, um, he's got no, his band. No, I mean, we, me and Eddie talk about music a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess that makes us have a lot more in common than some people but no nah, not really I didn't really have anything to do with with uh, mm -hmm. since um, you know kind of following him around and before you started Jiu Jitsu sometimes when you meet um, you know you follow somebody for so long when you meet them it's kind of surreal you want to talk about your first time you met Eddie well the first time I met him was at that seminar mm -hmm. and so but like the first time I hung out with him, like just really spent some time with him. Uh, well, yeah, it's just, it's a weird experience <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I, especially at that time, I wasn't shy, but I was very like um, sheltered, I would say, even as an adult, I had not seen much of the world or um, been exposed to many different ways of thinking or. Oh, yeah. You know, people outside of the South, you know, I knew people, but I didn't really know people. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. I understand and that. And so having Eddie Bravo hang out for a weekend was uh, an eye opening experience. Like, I didn't even know how to hang out with him. <laughs> he's like, you know, he's like a rock star uh -huh. in the jujitsu world. And at that time, too, you know, he's married and got, got his son now. Draco and so he's a lot more like mellow than he used to be but at that <laughs> time I was like man this dude is crazy <laughs> so, oh man yeah it took me a while to like acclimate to uh to his um uh, just to him his, his but, way of thinking and like, some of his theory <laughs> yeah he's become a, a really close friend over the years though of course so oh, that's cool all right. I'm sure it took a little, a little getting used to being around me too. So. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All right. So we move on here and um, 
probably ask you a few few more questions here uh, and some little off the wall questions. Um, since you're doing Tenth Planet, I ask you you know a little bit of weird question. How would you explain Tenth Planet Jiu Jitsu to an alien from outer space that just you know arrived here on Earth? Um, I would say that we simulate hand to hand combat every night. Like just, uh, that's what we do. So we train for hand to hand combat every night. Mm-hmm. Cool. I don't, like you guys, you guys know what war is, right? Aliens. Y'all know what wars are battles, <laughs> right? You know how in the battle, sometimes you end up one-on-one, but what if both of you are one-on-one and there's no weapon now? What? That's what we train for every day. <laughs> cool. All right. And have you named your your top five jujitsu players or your competitors? Ooh, okay. All time or current? All time. All time. Marcelo Garcia. Nice. <laughs> Hazier Gracie. Mm. Uh, I'm a big Eddie Bravo fan. I don't know if you knew. Big, big Eddie Bravo fan. Oh, Good. man. So now I got to start. Oh, Eduardo Tellis, for sure. I'm a big Eduardo Tellis fan. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yes. I love watching that. I love his jiu-jitsu. It's just so just easy, effortless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the way it should look. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, yeah, in a lot of ways, I think you're right. But I also like to see, like, super aggressive players, too. Like, Nathan Orchard, for instance, is probably one of my favorite competitors. Oh, yeah. He, and he's a, he's a close friend of mine. He's one of my favorite guys to watch. Just goes after it, dude. Yeah, and I just watch y'all's match. Non-stop. He's <laughs> on the bottom of Mount trying to find a way to attack you. It's uh-huh. crazy. So there's a lot of there's a lot of beauty in that kind of jujitsu too. Uh, I love to watch Gordon Ryan right now. He's probably my favorite current competitor. Oh yeah. Nice. Gio Martinez is another great one. Uh-huh. Yeah, I love those guys. Okay, we got a uh, top five jujitsu submissions. My five, my five favorite submissions. Yes. Oh, that's kind of a lazy answer, but I don't know if I have if I have a five favorite. I, <laughs> it's hard to I, choose I, five. <laughs> I like the Estima Lock. That's probably one of my favorites. That's, I do, uh, that's the one you call I, the Sock Lock too. Yeah, I call it the. I I used to call it the Sock Lock uh-huh. before any before it really had a name, but now the. The name Estima Lock has caught on, so I don't want people being like, oh, well, you're just calling it a soft lock. Okay, okay, it's Estima Lock. That, that, that won the nomenclature battle. You guys win. Uh-huh. So, Estima Lock. Um, I like to do an Ezekiel choke. I call it a punch choke. It's a little different than okay. an Ezekiel choke. Um, it's kind of the grip is is different, and uh, the choking making what actually makes the choke work is different than an Ezekiel. But Catching um, the knuckles. Kinda. It's not really the knuckles. It's, it's more like the, the, the blade of my hand, like the soft part on the pinky side of my hand. Oh, okay. Is what makes the choke on that side. It's the shoulder on the other side. But uh-huh. that's that's a choke that I actually get a lot. Those are probably just my two top submissions that I get. I bet you surprise a lot of people with that. Because some people yeah, don't a lot get of people respect. Yes, that's exactly right. A lot of good people. I put some pretty good guys to sleep with it because they don't want to tap to it because it's not a real move. Yeah, they end up sleeping, and you got to kind of wake them up in front of their friends and stuff. It's embarrassing. <laughs> Only embarrassing for one. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, of just straight arm locks. I like straight arm locks, huh. and um, yeah, I guess that's it for me. Like, I, I do a lot of a lot of submissions, I guess, but I try to run through. The same three or four over and over and over. I'm a pretty boring grappler, really. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well-rounded, but kind of boring. <laughs> uh, well-rounded positionally, but I end up taking the same three or four submissions all the time. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's true with a lot of people. You develop that area that, I mean, you just, you just dominate one area sometimes, and others can be, you know, pull off a hat trick um, submissions all the way around, but a lot of people yeah. focus on that, you know, just two or three. Well, with good, when you're rolling with good people, like good black belts, not just black belts, but good black belts, uh-huh. you know, you're only going to hit your best stuff anyway, if you uh-huh. hit anything at all. 
Yeah, that's true. And so, you know, you rolling with a white belt or a blue or a purple belt, you know, you might catch six different submissions on six different rolls, but that's probably not going to be the case rolling with a good dude. Uh-huh. You, you'd be lucky to catch him at all, you know, much less to tap him with, this, you know, these moves you don't really have refined. Yeah. It takes a lot of dedication to finish a lot of the moves. Some of them are, you know, we get into bad habits where you can finish them in a sloppy manner, depending on your, um, you know, how many people that you're training with. But if you're always with higher level people, you're going to get better as you go on. I heard a little, um, I think it was um, Trapplegate was talking about training with breaking pressure and how your submissions were applied. I think he done a video on that not too long ago. Yeah, I saw that. Sean Applegate. Yeah. He's he's one of my brown belts. He's a great guy. Mm-hmm. He runs the school down in Gulf Shores. Great guy and a really, really strong jiu-jitsu player, too. Really strong. Yeah. I'm a fan of his. I follow him and, you know, some of his activities on the on the net, some of his competitions. Yeah, he's really good. Uh, we'll get here. Um, top five songs or top five of your artists? Since you're uh, being coming from a musician background, also. All right, five. Let's see. My favorite song ever is probably "Yellow Lead Better" by Pearl Jam. Hmm. Interesting. I really, I really love that song. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, Pearl Jam is probably my favorite band. Oh yeah. Uh, man, bands I've been listening to a lot lately. I've been listening to King of Leon a lot. I listen to kind of boring huh. music too. I've been listening to Kings of Leon a whole lot. Huh. I love Dave Matthews Band. You oh, know, yeah. I'm just I'm just a boring person. I like <laughs> normal normal music, like normal guy music. I don't I'm not into like, you know, no death music, metal musicians music or you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely no <laughs> death metal. I'll I'll cry. It's just scares me. <laughs> yeah, I listen to a little bit of everything. A little bit of I'll shoot. I listen to country. Shoot to some opera if it's good. Some death metal. Back to just you know regular hip hop. It just depends on you know if it's got quality to it. It's got to have some type of quality. It can't be trash. Yeah, I don't even care if it's trash honestly anymore. <laughs> I, I just got to wear like I, I kind of started falling into that three chords in the truth. Oh yeah. Kind okay. Of, <laughs> kind of philosophy. Uh, a band, another band I really like a lot lately is Muse. Over oh, the last five yeah. or six years, I've been really listening to a lot of Muse. Mm-hmm. Big Radiohead fan. I like nice. Queen a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, you know it's a band I used to love? Which oh, one? wait, wait. I used to love Ho- Hootie and the Blowfish. When oh, I was yeah. young, I loved, I loved that band. Uh-huh. Uh, I, still, I still like them, actually, but like listen to that music they're not around anymore i don't guess yeah i think i think he does a lot of solo stuff i know he's yeah um, he got into country music yeah. which i never really got into i never got into his uh his solo career too much mm-hmm. um but he had some good songs oh yeah uh, i, like I think i'm a big uh i'm a big sarah Bareilles fan if you know who that is no she, i hadn't heard of that she's uh i mean she's just like a singer songwriter uh-huh she's kind of she just come out in the last you know or popularly, she's just been out three, five years, something like that. I really love her as a songwriter. But, you know, it's like real poppy, real poppy music. Oh, yeah. Is it top 40 or? Yeah, she's definitely been top 40. She, okay. You know that? I'm not going to write you a love song because you ask for it. <laughs> That's her. Nice. We're going to have to throw some tips out for that one. <laughs> oh, man, listen. Everybody's listening to this, or anybody that's listening to this, is going, man, this is the this is the wussiest jujitsu dude of all time. <laughs> listening to Sarah Bareilles and Hootie and the Blowfish, but it's just what I like. Yeah, they'll change your I mind know. once they hit the mat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe uh-huh. they might just might just slaughter me. Who knows? <laughs> all right, um, now I'll let you choose between this one. We do um, either guitars or cards. Top five guitars oh. or top five cars. Well, I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> like, I couldn't even tell you. I can barely tell you anything besides the color of my own car. Oh, really? So, oh, dude, I know nothing. I nothing thought you maybe all. had a little little grease monkey in you. No, none at all. I know <laughs> nothing. So, uh, top five guitars? Yeah. Well, I'm a Taylor man, Taylor Acoustics. Really? I love, love playing Taylor Acoustics. Mm. 
Um, got high quality taste. <laughs> yeah, they're beautiful sounding guitars. Um, so I don't know if I have a top five. I tell you, the electric guitar I always wanted. I've never had one. It's a Gibson SG. Oh, wow. that's what I always wanted. Dude. Mm. A red one, like um, like Angus, like Homeboy from yeah Angus Young from ACDC. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. I want that guitar. Yeah, those are nice. I think I've only seen a couple or people that actually own those guitars. I've been around a couple of people. Man. But some people don't keep those long. They they look good, dude. Yeah, that, that's the kind of guitar that makes you want to smash it in half after you rock it out. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I guess as far as, like, guitars that I like to hear the most, mm -hmm. Fender Stratocaster. Yeah. It's a, just a big old fat strap, American strap. You can always tell really the sound pretty. of a strap when you hear it. Yeah, so I mean, There's no mistake in that. <laughs> All right. So we, I don't know if that's a top five, but that's – that's a, Oh, yeah, I, I believe so. That's one of my top five. I'm no, I'm no connoisseur of guitars, but, I mean, I have my – Yeah, I'm not either. I don't, I don't care that much about, about, like, the brands of them and stuff. There's – I mean – I do care about acoustic guitars a lot more than electrics. So electrics, you can almost make an electric guitar sound like whatever you want to now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, the modeling. And, yeah, the modeling and everything is so good now. You can kind of just make it. And I'm, I'm speaking very generally. Obviously, like a tone snob is going to be like, dude, you're being ridiculous. And they're <laughs> right. I'm being ridiculous. But I'm speaking from the perspective of an amateur here. You know? Yeah. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But now with acoustics, I can really hear, I, I really feel there's a big difference in uh, the way a Taylor sounds versus the way like a, you Martin. know, a, a 500, $600 Fender would sound. Yeah. Those are a huge difference. Because you walk into like a guitar center or something and you play two or three acoustics and you're going to get two or three different sounds. And some of them are just, some of them just sound better on tape and others sound like, you know, they're just all dead. Uh, yeah, that's true too, man. The the recording skill and quality is a big a big factor on on a lot of a lot of those instruments. Uh -huh. All right, so we saved the big one for last. It's not really a top five, but it's something that you know the buzz is pretty strong right now. Being running around talking about um, McGregor versus Mayweather. Any thoughts that you care to share about those two and the match they have coming? Well, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very excited to watch that. Uh -huh. I think that's going to be like an, one of those all-time sporting off. events. Yeah, it's all-time sporting event people are going to talk about forever. Uh -huh. So I think it's a great move by both guys. Now, having said that, I don't think there's any way McGregor wins that fight. <laughs> it's a boxing match. Yeah. It's not a fight. He's walking into a strange area. Yeah, I mean, you know, he – would would McGregor smash the average boxer? Probably, mm -hmm. but he's not about. I don't know if he can touch Mayweather. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. How I don't that, think how Mayweather's that dynamic gonna, plays out. I don't think Mayweather's going to knock him out. But I mean, that wouldn't shock me. I don't yeah. guess it would shock me if I, it kind of would. It would be crazy if he does because it has, has how many knockouts does he have on his record? Mayweather, not yeah. that many. Last uh -huh. time he knocked somebody out was when that dude headbutted him. Yeah. Remember that? I can't remember what fight, who that was that headbutted him. And I think that was back in some of his earlier days. Um, no, it hasn't been that. It hasn't been just a few years ago. It hadn't? Okay. Yeah. But the guy, the guy hit him with a headbutt in the corner and then tried to apologize and he turned his back. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember. I don't remember the guy's name. But I remember seeing that yeah, when he turned his back. It was. <laughs> Not exactly the highlight reel knockout that you would expect. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think McGregor would be turning his back on him like that. <laughs> no, but well, McGregor's bigger. You know, he's quite a bit bigger, mm -hmm. which means he's going to be longer. So it, it's an interesting – I mean, I'm super interested in it. Yeah, and I think that's one thing. Is, I mean, it's no secret to, you know, coaches or anybody out there. When you If you beat somebody, you kind of take them out of their element and expose them, and that's how you beat them. And it's interesting yeah. to see if McGregor can get into that boxing element and um, just survive. 
But it's a it's a feather Ooh. in both of them's cap. Which whatever the outcome, I mean, neither one of them can lose. Well, I hope he wins. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, that would be awesome for MMA. Yeah, but I'm not I'm not banking on it. So if you line my pocketbooks, I'll take the fight myself. Outstanding. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad plan, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're going to wrap up the interview here. And I appreciate you giving your time. Um, and if where is 10th Planet Decatur located? You want to tell everybody where this at? Yeah, so it's 10th Planet Decatur, and uh, we're in North Alabama. So we, we have a full schedule here. Got a really large facility. It's about 6,000 square feet. We got a huge mat space. Nice. Got bunches of different programs from fitness kickboxing to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai. Got a kid, nice kids program. So, huge program. Good things going on over here. Really large team. And then I uh, got my website, which is www.brandonmc.ninja. And that's where I. Uh, film my classes here and mm-hmm. I post them online. Uh, and, uh, and that's five dollars a month. It's five dollars a month. That's right. And actually, we'll just um, kind of finalize a deal with. I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Cole Miller. He fought in the UFC. Oh yeah, I just watched that uh, a couple of days ago. Yeah, so Cole about the striking fought, aspect. Cole fought twenty times in the UFC. 20, 20 fights. Twenty two counting his fights in the Ultimate Fighter house. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, he's coming on board with the website and we're going to offer a premium section for nine ninety nine a month. And Cole is going to be teaching um, striking and MMA and he's going to do some gi jujitsu in that section as well. Nice. So and then, of course, all the videos that I've already got up will be available on that side as well. And he's um, another ground wizard. If anybody hasn't followed him, they need to go watch a few of his fights. Yeah, he's one of the best his competitions. Players. One of the best jujitsu players in the UFC. You know, he's not with he's retired now, but mm-hmm. um, an amazing, amazing martial artist. Very well rounded, excellent striker. And he's still excellent American top team? Jiu-jitsu. He is an American top team, yep. Yes. Black belt from American top team. All right, cool. And you know, you can't beat that value on uh, website especially if you're following martial arts and you're just a martial arts fan when you're paying five dollars a month and you're getting all this material if you hadn't watched any of brandon's one minute jujitsu hacks um and you're just totally missing out on um you know another level of jujitsu there something that you can add in your game or maybe something that you need to watch out for (laughs) from him or somebody else appreciate that man thank you Oh, you're welcome. And I appreciate the time again. And um, shoot, man, uh, keep in touch and I'll keep following you. Keep doing your thing down there in Decatur. Cool. So, yeah. Make sure you give me a link um, where I can direct people to the podcast. Great. All right. Keep up the great work and I'll catch you later. All right. Thanks, brother. Follow his Instagram. Follow his website at brandonmc.ninja. And on his website there, you can register for the low cost of $5 per month and obtain more jujitsu than you can handle. And if you're listening to the podcast on iTunes, make sure you subscribe, leave a review, let me know what you think about the podcast. And that's a wrap for this episode, and I'll be talking to you guys on episode 6. Episode 6.